everyone. Welcome to another amazing episode of Agritech Founders Diary. I'm your host, Kenneth Obayuana, a show where we interviewed agritech entrepreneurs who are doing amazing stuff in the agritech space. And today is not different. We're having an amazing guest joining us all the way from the USA. He's no other person than Harry Gordon Smith. He is the CEO of Agritecture. Today we'll be hearing him share with us his stories and his journey so far in the agri-tech space. All right, guys, thank you very much for joining us this. It's my pleasure, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, good to have you. So first of all, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Where you started from, where the entire journey started from? Sure, so I'm Henry from yeah. Agritecture and yeah. uh, as a college student, yeah. I was studying political science. Oh. And in the studies of political science, it's not really anything about agriculture at all. Yeah. But I had this visiting professor from Mexico, Dr. Raul Pacheco Vega, and he was an expert in water wars. Ah. Okay, so these are like wars that people have, countries have over water resources. And yes. water and agriculture are connected. So this blew my mind. I was like, okay, there's all these problems that you don't even hear about in the news related to resources. I want to make a difference in climate change and in water. Yeah. And as I looked deeper into water and I did some research, I found more about the connection between water and food. Hmm. Right? You have no food without water. Yes. And I started exploring how I could make a difference. And I had an experience blogging. I was yeah. a blogger for my university oh. about like student life, like what's it like to be in the dorm rooms, <laughs> first day of class. And uh, I decided maybe I can create a blog, kind of like what you're doing, yeah. to explore my ideas yeah. and to learn what people liked. Oh. And so I started three blogs. One oh. was called Technology Water, one was called Urban Layering, and one was called Agritecture. Oh. And I ran all three blogs for six months to see which one I liked the most and which one other people liked. And agritecture was so much more popular and so much more interesting to me. Uh. And agritecture as a concept is the art, science, and business of integrating agriculture into cities. Mm. So it's really about architectural thinking and bringing to the cities. So I brought case studies into my blog. I visited farms. I analyzed the business, the technology, the design spoke to the farmers, and the blog got quite popular. Mm. There were some other things that happened after that. Do you want me to continue? Yes, go. Okay, okay. On. Give us the Because this is the whole story. Yeah. So. <laughs> so then the blog started in 2010, 2011, mm. and then I finished my studies, and I wanted to learn more about the topic. So I stopped mm. the other blogs, and I just focused on agriculture, but I had to work. I was doing other jobs. You know, I couldn't start a business. I didn't even know what the business would be. I just <laughs> knew I liked the topic. So I started running some workshops called, um, you know, agriculture workshops. And we would basically go to a city, we would pick three sites, and we would build three teams, interdisciplinary teams, architects, entrepreneurs, marketing people, farmers. And each team would have to look at the site uh, and choose their site and then design a farm mm -hmm. in one day. Yeah. So we'd like give them a lot of knowledge, everybody's running around, and they would design a farm and they would pitch it, and then we'd have like a winner. Now in the process of that thing, I sort of developed the methodology in those mm. workshops. What are the steps to planning a successful urban farm? You know, from market research to developing the concept, to drafting the farm, to choosing the site, to building an economic model, and sort of pitching your business. So all those steps were sort of in the workshop. And so that's important, is that that methodology was developed by me pretty early. Now, I still didn't know enough about agriculture, so I started studying online food security and urban agriculture, a great online course at, at the time it was called Ryerson University, now it's called Metropolitan University. Oh. And it's a great course about how urban farms are in different places and the relationship between urban agriculture and food security. And I just loved the topic more. I was like, okay, I love this, I wanna learn more, I wanna learn more, and I kept blogging. And then in 2014, I, um, I got contacted through my blog by Deloitte, a consulting oh, firm yay. in Jordan. They, I mean, they're global, but they had an office in Jordan. And they, had, they said, you know, we're looking for data on vertical farming, this new technology for urban farming. And everyone's saying you have the data. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I said, well, why don't you talk to like the lighting companies or the suppliers or whatever? And they said, well, we don't trust them. They're just trying to sell their equipment. We just need a consultant that tells us sort of unbiased, tech agnostic consulting. And this light bulb went off in my head. I said, oh, there's a business here. <laughs> okay, so I, so I said, okay, uh, I'll do that for whatever, X amount of dollars. And I went to my boss, because I had a job. Yeah. I went to my boss and I said, hey, can I do this consulting deal and make some money? I was working for a water company. Mm. And he said, yeah, go for it. So I started consulting within my existing job. 
Mm. And so I did that one. And then a school in, the, in Maryland, a special needs school for youth with developmental challenges contacted me and they said, we want to build a small vertical farm to teach them food safety, how to grow some food, how to sell in the market. And again, these are youth that they have many challenges. So mental and physical. So we had to really be creative with the design. So those were our first two projects. Wow. And then I started hiring people. I hired um, Andrew Carter, who's now the CEO of Smallhold, a big mushroom company. And I hired a really smart team and we started consulting. We, we launched the world's first urban agriculture consulting firm. Ah. So flash forward to today, we've done about 270 consultations, different projects Whoa. in 40 different countries. So very global. That's amazing. Yeah, let's go, <laughs> entrepreneurship. So yeah, it wasn't, it was from 2011 till 2014, the blog, and then we've been consulting since 2014. And in 2017, I went out on my own. So my boss gave me a lot of support in the first mm. years, let me do the consulting, reduce some of the risk with being an entrepreneur. Uh, and in 2017, we negotiated a deal that he became the lead investor and we went out on our own. And wow. since then we've been, uh, yeah, on our own doing the scary uh, entrepreneurship thing. Oh, great, great story, you know. <laughs> so what, 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 what about your blog now? Is it still running? Are absolutely, sure? absolutely. We still blog all the time. We publish three times a week at least. And now we just recently launched three newsletters dedicated to different sectors oh. or different audiences. So we have a newsletter for investors that I write. Okay. We have a newsletter for entrepreneurs that yeah. my colleague uh, David writes. And then we have a newsletter for policymakers that my colleague Jeffrey writes. Oh, great. And then we have a lot of other things. I also do my own LinkedIn. So I'm constantly doing uh, the same thing we did at the beginning. It's in our, it's in our business model and in our DNA yeah. to share knowledge. Oh. Because that's part of the business model, right? We create content. Yeah. People learn. They get inspired. They get yeah. educated. They trust us. Yeah. And then they contact us for consulting. Great. I mean, I, I, your entire journey was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it feels like a dream. You know, this is the short story. In reality, it was also a nightmare. I mean, there's so many problems, so yeah. many failures, right? When you, when you tell the story in the short form, it sounds nice and easy and inspiring, but yeah. it's very important for any entrepreneur or potential entrepreneur to know it's, it's hell. Yeah. Like, it's really, really hard. And there's so many times where you feel like you're not gonna get through it and you feel like everything's gonna fall apart. Okay, great, good story, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I feel already inspired by your story. What unique technology innovations or solutions does a company provide to improve efficiency, sustainability, or productivity in agriculture? Okay, so first of all, urban agriculture yes. is not necessarily new. Yeah. It's typically done with soil, sometimes it's done on rooftops. It's not necessarily very high tech, typically, most urban farms. Yeah. Agritecture brings in the role of technology into urban agriculture and even farms like near cities, peri-urban agriculture, not just small farms in cities. We also do big farms too, multi-million dollar, tens of millions of dollar projects as well. But we also like to work with the small farms and bring technology into those projects. So the technologies specifically tend to be controlled environment agriculture. This is an umbrella term that includes Indoor hydroponics and greenhouses yeah. could be simplified, but this technology which saves water, saves nutrients, doesn't require soil, all the way up to high-tech robotic vertical farms where there's no sunlight, there's LED artificial lights, and there's automation automating the whole solution as much as possible from seeding to transplanting to production, packaging. There's also other aspects of big data. When we work with cities on policy advising, we also use GIS technology, oh, satellite data to look at this. Yeah. And we've done some work also with outdoor agriculture with IoT and AI and various big data solutions as well, including sophisticated sensors for soil or cameras that look at plants for computer vision to study the plants and see what's happening before something goes wrong. So there's really a whole suite of technologies, but mm -hmm. most of them relate to optimizing control and efficiency to reduce the use of eliminate the use of pesticides ideally, but at least reduce it and significantly reduce water use, land use, and optimize the quality and consistency of the production. Mm. So we bring those to our clients. Again, we bring it to the, the world through education, but we also, because I mentioned the blog is important, we bring to our clients through the feasibility studies we do, yeah. the research, the design. Yeah. So we actually do HVAC analysis. We design the plumbing and the layouts of the farms because I've got an incredible technical team behind me that supports and executes the projects. Wow. I mean, your story is really inspiring to me, even though I'm interviewing you. Like, I feel really inspired that, whoa. You know, I studied agriculture, and um, sitting beside 
someone's study political costs. Political science, Political yeah. science is quite not quite a farmer, it's not I'm a farmer. Not a farmer. <laughs> and like, I'm like, oh, what have I been doing? I studied farming agriculture for five years in, back in Nigeria. And I, I went to UK to do my master's program for another one year. And like, what have I been doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think that's bad. I think that you know, I have huge respect for agricultural experts and, and farmers. We need more of that. But I think that in the, it's very important that in today's world, if you want to be an entrepreneur, for example, you need to be capable in many different skills. Yeah. You have to be able to communicate. Yes. You have to be able to understand the data. Yeah. You don't want to say anything that's not true. Yeah. You have to be good at understanding numbers and yeah. finance, yeah. marketing, yes. managing people. Yeah. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you can't just study entrepreneurship. Yeah. You need to actually experience things and form yourself into a more, let's say, holistic individual to meet the needs of being a CEO or founder. And that takes time. It takes experience and a lot of failure. Great, great. Okay, let me ask you, what are the biggest challenges you faced in scaling your, your business, your architect business, and have you overcome them? So when it comes to consulting services in particular, it's not considered scalable. Yeah. Scalability is really about expanding what you're doing, and every time you expand, the profit margin also expands. Okay? So if I have a hardware and I manufacture it, as I buy more of it, as I build more and I get more customers, my cost of production goes down, that's scalability. Or if I have a software product and I build it and my customers increase, my users increase, my software costs don't necessarily increase that much, that's scalability. Yeah. But with services, you always have to hire more people. Yes. Right? You, you have to hire more people all the time. So a lot of investors, a lot of people don't think it's scalable. Um, I think that there's levels of scalability. You know, you can productize a service. Like our feasibility studies, we've done them hundreds and hundreds of times. So we know how to do them. So once you do it the 10th time, the 20th time, the 50th time, the speed and accuracy and the problems that typically happen with the services are reduced. So our profit margin increases. You also get bigger deals. So in addition to optimizing the service and almost creating to a product, which is more scalable than a service, yeah. you actually increase the deal size. Yeah. So my portfolio grows and I get attraction from bigger clients. Yeah. And so as my client base gets bigger, the average deal size goes up and the profit margin goes up. Mm. Now, there's problems that can happen. You can have a difficult client, you can have scope creep, you can have an employee that doesn't perform the way you want. So nothing's perfect. But if you run the business around process and optimization, there is scalability in that. So that's one way we've solved it. Another way we've solved it is through digitization and, okay. and software. So in 2020, when the pandemic hit, our services really suffered. People sort of weren't hiring consultants in the same way they were before. So we sort of thought, okay, what could we do to respond to this new digital era, era where everyone's at home? I said, well, what if people could farm their, plan their farms at home? Oh. Mm. So we built Agritecture Designer, which is our newest, our first product and our newest part of our business. And Agritecture Designer is the world's first farm planning software. You can log into the software oh. and you can take online classes to learn about urban agriculture, greenhouses, vertical farms, business models, technologies, crops, everything you would need to know. And then you can use our market research tool to go to the market with your phone or our use your computer yeah. to look at the prices in the market and choose the right prices for your products to sell. Then you can use our modeling tool, which is the main IP. This is where all of our data and our methodology, the same methodology for the workshops, yeah. is now in the software. And you can go step by step answering questions on a form, choosing from over 100 different crops, putting in your location. When you put the location in, we automatically bring in how much light the location gets, humidity, weather, et cetera, to update the economic model and the climate model in the greenhouse or vertical farm. And so you answer all these questions, and then within minutes, you get a feasibility study, a light feasibility study. So this is another way we can scale up because software is typically has higher margins and higher scalability than services. And we also get to achieve our mission which is we can help many more thousands of people. I'm proud of 270 consultation clients, but I want to help thousands, tens of thousands of new farmers. Software allows us to do that in a more scalable way. Mm. Great, that's really great. So, ah, this, this is really good. Okay, let me ask you, have you ever raised funds or have you been able to fund your business so far in terms of funding? 
Yeah, so in terms of the consulting service, again, like investors don't really like to fund consulting oh, services. So you might get an angel investor at the beginning. And that's what happened is that first boss I mentioned that I worked yeah, for, yeah. he gave the first amount of investment. Another thing that's interesting about services is you don't actually need investment because you make money quickly, right? So if I build a software, I'm not gonna make money for a long time. Or if I build a product, I'm not gonna make money for a long time. But with services, with consulting, I can make money from day one, Yes. right? Yes. You hire me, yeah. you're gonna pay me hopefully on time. Yeah. Pay on time, you guys. Yes. Hope, hopefully pay on time, you know? Yes. And then I have cash flow. Yeah. So consulting is good cash flow. So you can fund the growth of the business. So as the cash flow increased and as we had profit, I could hire more people. Yeah. It wasn't as fast, right? This has been a long journey. Um, and, but external investment was not the objective and it wasn't really gonna be easy to get. Yeah. Now, when we launched the software, we had to spend a lot of money to build the software. Yes. And software is something that investors are more interested in investing in. Yeah. So we ran a seed round and fundraised for the first part of the software. Yeah. And we will also do another round to fundraise for the next stage of the software. So how was it like for you to raise your first uh, fund? It was hell, hell on earth. Fundraising is the worst. <laughs> fundraising is the worst. It's terrible because investors, it's, it, it, you have to put so much time into finding an investor that gets what you're doing. Uh, like it's on you, of course. You have to pitch well, you have to explain your business well. But I went through an accelerator. I learned the typical strategies. Oh. And what I really learned was that I was spending so much more time fundraising just to get money for investment, which again, they buy a piece of the business, yeah. versus consulting where I could spend a little bit of time and make cash. Yeah. So for me, it was like, why am I doing this? You know, why am I fundraising? Because they just waste your time. They, they have all the power. Yes. They can ignore you. They can say, oh, we're enthusiastic and they never respond. They get all of your data. They get to, you, you give them all your information because you're trying to uh, you know, get them interested in your business, but they really have no commitment to you. So it's very stressful. Um, you never know when they're gonna do it. I had some investors, I have amazing investors now, by the way. I love my investors. They're really, really good. They're smart, they give good advice. But I have some investors that sort of signed documents saying, I'm gonna fund the business. Yes. So I get that document, I say, yay, we raised, we got, we got our money, you know? And they have 30 days to fund the business, but they don't fund, they don't put the money in. 60 days goes by, nine days goes by, 120 days go by. And so you're the business owner and you have milestones you need to hit. And this investor not only wasted your time, but created a false sense of security. And you know what, they don't really care because they, they have a different attitude, not all investors, but many investors, especially VC investors, yes have a different attitude about their position of power and their expectations. Yeah. So, you know, I have a lot I learned from that experience. Yeah. I would say I know how to target my fundraising a little bit better. I would say I know how to communicate what I'm asking for. I know how to do due diligence on these funders more. And I never, I never celebrate until the money's in the bank. <laughs> now, what advice do you have for Agritech funders who are, who are also looking at raising some funds for the agritech business, and what advice do you also have for venture capitalists or angel <laughs> investors who are also considering investing in the agritech space? Okay, let's start with agritech um, entre entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs yeah. So uh, there's a lot of different kinds of agritech businesses. So yeah. this is some general advice. Yeah. Um, I think the first one is uh, sell yourself. Mm -hmm. especially if you're early stage, yeah. right? We're talking about early stage yes. seed funding or pre-seed funding. Yeah. Above all things, the investors are investing in you, the founder or the co-founders. Yeah. So it's very important you communicate your passion, your commitment and your expertise. Mm. So you really need to sell that and connect with them. Number two, I would say is the value proposition. You know, it's very important that Good companies, the best companies, especially at the beginning, they do one thing very well and better than anyone else. So a lot of entrepreneurs, they have too many things in their business plan, too many things they're doing. Investors really get turned off by that. Focus on the one thing that you're gonna dominate on. You can mm. talk about other things in the appendix or later on, but the one thing that you're doing, because you need to have a message that's memorable. Yeah. You need to allow them to think about it. And that value proposition is really how you're solving the problem. Number three is, what's the market, okay? Really, the, the investors, especially early stage investors, are really looking for great entrepreneurs, big problems to solve, the biggest market possible, right? So if, if, if your market is, I wanna work with hotels in Nairobi, 
Yeah. It's a pretty small market. Yeah. It's addressable, but it's kind of small. Yes. So a VC investor is never going to fund that because it's not big enough. Yeah. But if your business is all wheat farmers in the world, that's a big market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need to make sure that your business connects to a big market. If it doesn't, you're just going to be keep trying and they're going to say no. Okay. <laughs> and I guess one final thing is like, oh, two more things. Okay, follow a process. Yeah. So step by step process, stick to it. It's very emotional. It's very stressful investing fundraising. And if you don't track the stages that the lead is through, meaning did you pitch to them? Do they have your documents? Did you follow up? Are they interested? Or are they not interested? You'll get overwhelmed because really, you know, you need to talk to like 10 on 10 investors a week. Hmm. Okay. So you're just like completely booked with these meetings. And if you don't have a process to organize that, you'll get overwhelmed. And the fifth one is FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> investors are motivated by two things. Yes. Okay. Greed, the fear of missing out on an opportunity hmm. or basically running away, right? If people are running away from a type of agri-tech like uh, plant-based foods, you're going to yeah, have a very yeah. difficult time fundraising. Like yeah. You can't change that emotion. Yes. So they're either running in too fast or they're running away too fast. Yeah. It's never in the middle for them. So I you have see. to play the game with the fear of missing out. You want to make them, it's like, it's like when you play hard to get when you're dating. Yeah. It's like, oh, hey, like, look at me. I've got all this stuff. But you know, I, if you're interested, that's cool, maybe, but I've got things to do. Like, that's how you have to play it because other, if you're desperate, they're, they smell it and they're not interested. Mm. It's very psychological. Now for the investors, yeah. don't do FOMO, don't be stupid. Like don't <laughs> just focus on whatever other investors doing and maybe you're gonna bet on one that's gonna be successful. Do due diligence, look at the companies, look at the founder, look at the market. Like I see too many investors that are just following the trend and they're gambling versus actually being strategic. So <laughs> the opposite of that FOMO. I just think it's very, very a waste of time and energy. Um, don't buy into greenwashing. In, in agri-tech especially, there's so many people who are saying, oh, we're saving the planet, or we're doing food security, or we save you know, 95% less water, but not actually providing the data. A good company will track its data. A good company will be honest, yeah. a company for the long term. It's easy to find short-term companies that can tell a story, but the real companies have integrity, honesty, data, and values. So I'd really look at those things. And um, yeah, hire a consultant like Agritecture who does due yes. diligence services yeah. if you're looking to do that. <laughs> that's good, that's good, that's good. Okay, but let me ask you, looking to the future, what are your long-term goals and visions for the, Im for the impact your Agritech company can make in the agriculture? Well, I think that on the consulting level, we want to continue to grow our deal size and our projects. Okay. We do a lot of work in the Middle East now. We would like to do more work in Africa and South America. Most of our markets, our clients are in the US, Europe, and the Middle East. So we have a lot of other markets we want to expand into. I don't really want to build a huge consulting business, uh, but I would like to have an office in the main markets and people on the ground that can interact with leads and share knowledge and build the business there. So you know, I would say I still want to have a boutique consulting business, but not grow it too big. Okay. In regards to the software, that's where we want to go a lot bigger. So when it comes to the software, right now it does greenhouses and vertical farms and container farms. And you know, we want to expand that to other types of agriculture, things like agrivoltaics, aquaculture, mm. maybe even agroforestry and regenerative agriculture. Basically, our thesis for the software is as the climate changes yeah. and basically volatility occurs, agriculture will need innovation and that innovation is driven by technology. So the yeah. CapEx will go up. The question is, where do you go to get the information about that CapEx mm. and about making those decisions? Sure, you can go to suppliers, but we know we can't trust suppliers fully all the time. Yeah. And we know that going to all these different suppliers takes a lot of time. And we know that the farmers or the entrepreneurs don't always know how to interpret the information they're getting from the farmers. Yeah. So agriculture designer is really about bringing a third party marketplace and data tools for all of the future of climate smart agriculture. Yeah. That's the bold, bold idea. That's the big market. That's what we're fundraising for in the next stage is that expansion. We want this to be a ubiquitous tool for planning all of these future farms, making the planning process faster, cheaper, and making the farmers have more of a chance of success as well as their investors. Mm, fantastic. Ah, it's been amazing time interviewing you. I mean, I've learned so much. Thank you so much, so for, much from your, for, from, from your interview. Um, I've learned how to, how to leave a job, man. 
I love the way you left your job. You didn't left with um, anger. Yeah. Yourself and your boss were still in good terms. I mean, your boss was your first investor. Yeah. That's a good way to build a relationship, you know. He's, he was, he's amazing. I mean, honestly, you have to find these people that are mentors and supporters, and you have to hold on to them and give back to them, yeah. too. But, you know, he was smart because he saw something in me and he let me do it. Yeah. But, you know, I was also smart to allow the experimentation of the early stages to exist there. Yes. You shouldn't start a business immediately yes. if you don't have the financial resources you should do it at night and on weekends yes. so that's sort of a similar model it reduced the risk yes. it was so scary though just the moment <laughs> i had to talk to him and be like hey i know you've been funding this business but it's kind of my idea and i want to own it because i didn't own any of the business right yeah. but i was basically a ceo for those yeah. first three years so that first meeting was so scary but yes it's a good piece of advice to people yeah. is reduce your risk when you're starting your business at the beginning. That's what I, that was one of the best things I did. Mm, great, that's fantastic. My last question to you is, <clears throat> what's your last message to other agri-tech entrepreneurs listening to us or watching us? What's the last message to them? Yeah, I think when it comes to agri-tech, which is really about food and sustainability and society, as an entrepreneur, you can be very naive, right? You can have all these goals. I wanna make money, I wanna change the world, I wanna feed the planet. It's really difficult, actually impossible, to solve all of these problems. What you really need to do in the early stages is take your energy, take your enthusiasm, and narrow it down to a specific impact. One thing that you can do really well, and focus on that all the time. Focus your brand around that, focus your business name around that, focus your mission, focus your team, focus all your technology, all your solutions on that. Once you solve that, you can start to do the other things. But being naive and doing too many things in the business is one of the greatest killers of new businesses. So focus, be motivated, and remain on target. Hmm. Remain on tired, guys. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Eri. It's been a pleasure having you on the show today. And guys, do wait well to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share this video with as many people you, you know that are interested in agriculture or agri-tech space. And subscribe, like the video, drop your comment on the comment section. I will do it to respond to you in the comment section. Once again, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you all. Thank you, Mr. Herring, for, for joining us today. We, it's a pleasure having you. I'm My really excited to have you on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I'm grateful.